Good morning. Before I begin with the main part of the video message today, I would just like to say a few words about the Reverend Professor Peter Bias. Many of you will have become familiar with Peter's Sunday video messages during lockdown, interspersing the Bible message with stories from his garden about blue tits, trees and sheep. Many of you, but maybe not all of you, will also know that Peter had a sudden and unexpected heart attack last Sunday morning, resulting in his sad and untimely death. We tend to think about Peter's ministry in the light of the past 12 months when he guided the church at Kempston East, firstly through a difficult period of recovery, and then of course through the current pandemic. But Peter's ministry was much more than that. He spent many years working with the Methodist Relief and Development Fund, both in this country and abroad, living in West Africa in the 1980s, and being the chair of the MRDF some 20 or so years ago. He moved from MRDF to being a professor of global health at Umeå University in Sweden, and so was someone eminently able to guide us as a church through this pandemic into planning the early stages of reopening our church buildings. Through all this, he was also a minister in the Methodist Church, leading worship as and when he was in the country. He was also, though, a family man, and our thoughts and prayers at this time are with his wife, Margaret, and his three sons, Richard, Mark, and Paul. He was a great man, a great minister for Christ, and he will be greatly missed. And so we thank God for everything he was able to do during his life and ministry. And we give thanks that he is now at rest with his Lord and Saviour. Amen. And so we come to the theme of this week's message. In her letter, in last week's e-newsletter that many of you would have received, Jane talked about our talents and gifts, and about how we are called and equipped to do different things. And at the end of her letter, Jane quoted a few verses from Paul's letter to the Romans. That passage just happens to be one of the lectionary passages for this week. And so I would like to continue this week with the theme that Jane began last week. And I'm going to read that passage from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Place your life before God. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God you will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognise what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, brings it, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us. 
not by what we are and what we do for him. In this way, we are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body. But as a chopped off finger or cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvellously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be. Without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other, or trying to be something that we aren't. If you preach, just preach God's message, message nothing else. If you help, just help, don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. Paul's words to the Romans in his letter, chapter 12. I'm guessing that over the past few months, many of us have become aware of the shortcomings of various parts of our bodies. Maybe we've had a nagging toothache, but have not been able to go to the dentist. Maybe our eyesight's been bothering us a bit, but the opticians have been closed. Maybe our hair's been getting on the long side, but we've been unsure about going to the hairdressers. I have to say that Mr. Amazon sent a set of hair clippers to our house, and for the first time in 50 years of married life, I let my wife have a, have a go at my hair. I think she did a good job. At least it didn't leave me banging on the barber's door, begging for an appointment. If, though, one bit of you has been giving you problems during isolation and lockdown, it's probably affected other parts of you in terms of having to either put up with it or take a risk and go and get it seen to. Now, the Apostle Paul was obviously keen about this idea of one body, many parts, because as well as writing to the Christians in Rome in the passage I just read, he writes something similar to the church in Corinth. And in this, he also relates us uh, as members of Christ's church to the various parts and members of our own bodies. To that, he adds, if one member suffers, all the members, suffers, all the members suffer with it. On the other hand, Paul says, if one member is exalted, all the members are celebrated along with it. In both letters, Paul wants us all to understand that every single member of the Christian family matters as much as every other one. And to do this, he's used this metaphor of the body. He's done this because in that part of the world, and in Rome in particular at that time, the body was considered to be an image of society. So this view would have resonated with the Romans because many Roman orators declared that within the civic body, different jobs had different levels of status. Some were more important than others, more high profile, more honourable, more valuable. Others, though, were dishonourable, fit only for the lower classes to carry out. But Paul takes a completely opposite interpretation and says that every single member of the body is just as indispensable as any other. No part can exist on its own, he says, as he gives the example of a chopped off finger or toe. Of course, Paul is not writing a medical manual here. 
He's using the human body and its parts as a metaphor for the church. So what is the church? Well, a few months ago, you may well have answered that question by saying, well, it's the building that we were sitting in at Kempston East. That, though, would have been the wrong answer. The building, which very few of us have ever even been inside of since the middle of March, is a church, but is not the church. In fact, I hope that over the past few months, you've all realised this fact, as we've all been church in so many different ways. We've all worshipped as a church, but not necessarily together, and not necessarily all in the same way, or at the same time. Christians in many parts of the world today don't have a building such as ours to meet in, but they are no less a church. Because as the worship song says, the church is not a building. The church is the people. And because we focus on what we think the church is, and not on what it really is, we often spend a disproportionate amount of time on the supporting issues, and we get sidetracked from what should be the main activities of the church. I think this is something that many of us have come to realise. Yes, we've missed the church, but is it actually the building at Kempston East that we've missed? Or is it the people that make up the church that we've missed? Some of you may have read what was a few years ago the kind of must-read book for many Christians. It was The Shack by William Paul Young. And I'm not going to go into what the book is all about, but just to read you a short quote from Jesus in this book. And I stress that this is not something that Jesus said during his earthly ministry, nor will you find it anywhere in the Bible. But this comment is made to a man suffering from a great personal trauma who questions what the church is. And Jesus's reply is, you're only seeing the institution a man-made system. That's not what I came to build. What I see are people and their lives, a living, breathing community of all those who love me, not buildings and programmes. So what is more important? The buildings or the people who are part of this church? and also the people who are not part of this church. I think we often focus too much on property and finance and things like that, and not enough on people. Using buzzwords, too much maintenance and not enough mission. And if we take the last few verses from that passage from Romans, Paul tells us what he thinks we should be focusing on. So let me read those to you again. If you preach, just preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help, don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. So we should be preaching, helping, teaching, giving encouraging guidance, not getting bossy or manipulative, helping people in distress, being quick to respond, working with the disadvantaged, and through all this, being happy. Ten different types of actions, none associated with buildings. All are associated with mission of one form or another. So as we've seen in this passage, Paul compares the church 
the body of Christ to a human body. And just as the body is made up of many parts, each with its own function and task, so everyone has a part to play as members of Christ's body, the Church. Now we know that almost every part of our own body has a use, apart from maybe the appendix. And we therefore have a need for it. It would be interesting to hear how Paul would phrase his letters today in this age of new knees and hips and organ transplants. But the fact that we have these things only emphasises how important all these individual parts are to our bodies as a whole. What about you then? What part of the body of Christ are you? What do you do to keep Christ's body, the church, functioning? And please don't answer that by saying that you're getting on in years and you've done your bit in keeping the church functioning because even though that may be true and you may have done lots of things in the church in the past, there are still things on Paul's list that you can do. Remember Paul's list of things that people do as part of Christ's body? Preacher, helper, teacher, encourager and guide, quick responder, worker with the disadvantaged and a happy person, always ready with a smile. And all of us can be at least one of these. Most of us can be more than one. But don't take the titles too literally or too narrowly. Preacher. Certainly don't take this one too literally. We're not expecting you all to take a turn at doing one of these video messages or to train as local preachers, although a few more of those would be nice if you feel called. You don't have to stand up in a pulpit to preach the gospel. You can do this by talking about Christ to your friends and neighbours. You can do it by living out the gospel of Christ in your daily lives. Helper. Lots of people have been going out of their way to help others during this pandemic. You only have to watch the news to see all the innovative ideas people have come, with, come up with of ways to help others. Particularly those who have been stuck, isolated in their homes for weeks on end. Teacher. Now we're starting to get into the more basic areas of where you can be a part of Christ's body. It's said that we never stop learning, and while that is true, it's also true to say that the older we get, the more experience of life we have. And so it's up to us, those of us who are older to try to pass on some of this experience to those who are younger. Not in any judgmental way, but in a compassionate and helpful way. Encourager and guide. This is also something that we can all do. Instead of dwelling on how bad things are at present, we can take the other view and look at all the good things that are happening and tell those people who are doing these things how much this all means to you. It's amazing what a word of encouragement can do for people. Back in March, I never thought that I would be producing a 20-page church magazine each week. But it's been the encouragement and messages of how this has helped people keep in touch with the church and its members during lockdown that has kept me going with it. And I do like Paul's comment, though, about not being bossy. I'm sure we've all come across situations where guidance has kind of turned into bossiness. It's easy to do. I'm sure we've all done it, and I'm sure we've all been on the receiving end of it as well. Being a quick responder. Again, this is something we can all do. It doesn't always need us to rush out and help when we hear of a problem. It could just be a phone call, offering support. We can respond to problems by, for example, supporting a young family going through some form of crisis just by being there for them even if it's only at the end of the phone. We can perhaps help by being a surrogate grandparent to a younger person. Often we're happier to accept advice from an older generation than we would be from our own parents. 
Then there's work with the disadvantaged. Now, depending on how you define this, you do probably need to have a certain skill set to work with the disadvantaged. But the work that's needed is not always hands-on and physical. Again, often all people need is some love, someone to listen to their problems and help with advice if that's appropriate. And the last of Paul's list, smile and be happy. Now that is something that we can all do. So in our reading, Paul says, we are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. And so as members of Christ's body, the church, we all need to be a part. A part that is active within the limitations of our own abilities. So let's not sit too comfortably because there are so many things that we can do as part of Christ's body, the church. Choose what you think you're best at and get on with it. But remember, the appendix has no function in our body. So don't be an appendix in the church. Amen. Let's come now and pray together for others in this world who need our prayers. Holy and gracious God, we pray for others. Prayers that bring to mind the world's realities. Please teach us not to be afraid, because it's here that we find you, sharing this deeply troubled world with us. Please bless all who are continuing to make a difference. For scientists working faster than ever before to find cures or vaccines for COVID-19. For chefs, volunteers, entertainers, neighbours and countless more. May they know your laughter and your love. We ask you to bless all who are there to care for those who are at their lowest, especially in health and care services. May they know your persevering strength. We pray for the hundreds of thousands who are grieving here and across the world for the loss of loved ones, the loss of livelihood, the loss of confidence and hope, the loss of any sense of well-being. And here I suggest we take a few moments of quiet to remember the life and ministry of the Reverend Peter Bias and to ask that his wife Margaret and his sons Richard, Mark and Paul will all know and feel your love surrounding them. May all those who are grieving know your comfort, strong and everlasting. We pray for people who need the world to be a more just and equal place, and for those who have the power to make changes. May it happen quickly and peacefully, and may they know your righteousness. We pray for all who need the world to remember them. Refugees and asylum seekers. All living in poverty and suffering from climate change. May we remember and may they know your provision through us. 
and we thank you for all those profoundly known and loved who enrich our lives every day. And again, in a moment of silence, we bring them before you. And so we ask these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. And we join together in our own way to say the Lord's Prayer. You may want to say it in the traditional form, you may want to say it in your own language. I'm going to say it in the contemporary version that we often use at Kempston East on a Sunday morning. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen.